So th this week, uh, we're going to be looking at Psalms chapter 51. Uh, this is week five, if I remember correctly, in our uh, sermon series on, on the summer of Psalms. Um, and uh, in John, Psalms chapter 51, um, this is a Psalm of David. And, uh, and this is a Psalm written by David after his affair with Bathsheba. And after uh, the prophet Nathan confronts him over his affair with, with Bathsheba. And so that should kind of give you a little bit of historical context uh, to, to this psalm, how it was written, written why it was written, and, and in the um, um, environment uh, in which it was written. And so let's, let's look at, at Psalm chapter 51. Uh, I'm going to read all 19 verses, and uh, so, so kind of bear with me on that part. And then we'll kind of break them down a little bit section by section. It says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. gladness let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You were not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering, and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. We, we thank you for all that you do for us. God, we, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come and to worship you to study your word. And God, we ask that you would just take, be with us during this time. Open up our minds and our hearts. Give us the, the passion for your word. God, that we would, we would learn your word, we would understand your message. And God, that we would apply it to our hearts and our lives. I ask things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as I said before, this, this is a psalm by David after... Um, He's confronted by Nathan. And, and it's important to understand that because Nathan comes to David on God's command. So God reveals David's sins to Nathan. And Nathan confronts David with his sin. And there, there had to have been a, a spiritual wrestling with David before this psalm was written. You know, in psychology, we talk about the, the, the stages of grief and the stages of guilt. And, and there had to have been a, at least a moment where David tried to deny. But here you see this psalm, and this psalm is David being, finally getting real with what he's done. And, and so, as we go through this, 
kind of keep that in mind and, and, and think of your own sins, the own, your own moments in your life when, when you've done stuff that you've tried to cover up, that you try to pretend didn't happen, and then you finally come to the realization that you have nothing else to do but to face it. And so just kind of keep that in your mind as we go through this. So let's look back at verses 1 through 4. It says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. David realizes he's messed up. There's no denying any more of the sins that he's committed. He, his plot that he devised to get rid of Bathsheba's husband and have Bathsheba for himself, it's been revealed. Once Nathan comes to him and reveals that to him, he knows basically the secret's out. So David takes the only approach that's left for him to take. He confesses that he sinned and throws himself before the mercy of the ultimate judge. He throws himself at God's mercy. And you see that. Be gracious to me, O God, O Lord, according to your loving. See, he's appealing to God's loving. He's appealing to God's love. He's not... And I want you to notice this. He's not asking God to ignore his sins. He's beyond the point of pretending that those sins existed. He's not saying, God, please just forget those sins. Please ignore those sins. What he's saying here is, is God, please cleanse me from those sins. What he's saying here is God show mercy even though I've sinned. David asked for grace and mercy. Most importantly, David asked for cleansing from the blameless God, from the blameless God that he's offended. Verses 5 and 6. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Again, you see, you desire truth. You know, one of my favorite, I, I guess you'd call it a, a guilty pleasure. I love watching those, um, those restaurant rescue shows. Um... You know where the uh, um, where the the consultant goes in and, and he completely changes the way they're doing things and, and takes them from a, a, a restaurant or a company that's losing thousands of dollars a month to a company that's, that's making thousands of dollars a month. And it's interesting because when you watch all of those shows and there's there's probably about a dozen different ones in there. When you watch all of those shows, there's one central theme that always happens at the beginning of every show. The consultant has to get the owner to admit that they're the reason they're failing. And that's what David is saying here. David is basically saying, God, God, I understand. You, you have to have truthfulness first. Before any type of reconciliation, before any type of forgiveness, before any type of restoration has to happen, we have to get truthful with God. More importantly, we have to get truthful with ourselves. We have to reach a point where we say, it's my fault, my life is messed up. It's my fault, my world is crashing down around me. Just like in these, in these restaurant rescue shows, that owner finally has to reach a point where they go, it's my fault, I messed up. I'm the reason my business is failing. I'm the reason my life is failing. It's our fault. And, and David comes to that realization here when he says, God, you desire truth. You desire your your first priority for us in, in restoration process is for us to get truthful with ourselves. For us to be willing to say, it's all on me. It's my sin that I've committed. Now, I want you to I want you to pay attention to this part where David says, I was brought forth in iniquity. What, what is he talking about here? 
See, we don't really know anything about David prior to him being anointed by Samuel. The Bible doesn't really tell us anything about David. David first comes onto the scene as a young shepherd boy. So what is he talking about when he says, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me? Well, those of y'all that know me know that I do a little research. So, and the question is, is this David referring to as we refer to now as the generational sins. So like I said, I did a little research. And here's what I found. And, and I conferred this over multiple websites, so I'm, I'm pretty confident in, in, in what I've discovered. After bearing seven sons, Jesse began to doubt his Jewish heritage. See, Jesse is the grandson of Boaz and Ruth. Uh, if you know your Bible stories, Ruth was a Moabite woman who married a Jewish, uh, basically business owner, a Jewish landowner named Boaz. Well, in Jewish law, it was forbidden for Jews to marry Moabites. And so Jesse starts doubting his standing in the Jewish community because of his discovering of Ruth being a Moabite and Boaz being a Jew. And so what he does is, is he, and really it's a misunderstanding because the law was that Jewish women were not allowed to be sent off to marry Moabite men. There was nothing in the law about Moabite women marrying Jewish men. And so that's where Jesse kind of has his confusion there. Well, Jesse, in this misunderstanding, he separates from his wife, Nisbeth, for a, a pretty long period of time. And he's already had seven sons. He separates from his wife. And he actually basically gets his wife's servant because his wife's servant was a Canaanite. And so Jesse's saying, well, if I'm part Moabite, I can... I can be with a Canaanite, and, and that doesn't break Jewish law anymore. So Jesse's kind of going through this period of where his his philosophical viewpoints are, are off base, really. Well, Jesse decides he wants to have another son, so he gets arrange, arranges for his wife's servant to provide that other son. Well, what happens is, is Nisbeth's uh, servant doesn't want to go along with this plan. So they pull a switcheroo and Nisbeth actually goes in with Jesse secretly and she gets pregnant with David. Well, Jesse is believing that Nisbeth is pregnant with another man's child and politely just lets her live, lets her stay. His sons want her dead. And there's, now there's a whole you know soap opera drama going on here. So David is born into Jesse's family with everybody in the family but his mother believing that he was born out of an adulterous relationship. And so his brothers hated him. And so here you have David saying, now, years and years later, I was brought forth in iniquity. I was conceived in sin. Because at this moment, he believes that his birth took place because of an adulterous relationship. And so, yeah, in a sense, David is refer referencing what he believes is a generational sin issue. He had an affair with Bathsheba, and he's basically, in a sense, in a moment, either justifying or explaining it to say, well, things like that happened in my family. Even I was born out of, a, out of an affair. And so, you know, he's basically saying it's only natural that I would have an affair myself because that's what my family does, apparently. 
And, and, and that kind of gives you where David's coming from when he says, I was brought forth in iniquity. I was born in sin. So let's move on to chapters, um, I'm sorry, verses 7 through 12. It says, Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Let your hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. So first I want to look at, and, and, and I didn't get into any Hebrew. I, I tried to get into some Hebrew this time, but everything just translated back to what the Bible uh, wording was anyway. So kind of wasn't a point in that. But I did look up what hyssop was. Anybody know what hyssop is? I looked it up today. <laughs> <laughs> you read ahead. Good. Hyssop is actually a minty, bitter herb. And it was often used to cleanse the digestive tract, but it was especially used to treat intestinal problems. It's important to understand that, and to, and to take notice that David specifically uses the word hyssop. Because what this tells you is David has become so consumed with this sin that it's literally making him sick. And so when David is saying, cleanse me with hyssop, what he's asking God to do is, is God, he's basically saying, God, this sin has so overtaken my life, I'm nauseous. I'm sick to my stomach over this sin. I've reached a point where this sin has consumed me to the point that it is literally making me ill. And he's asking God, I need a hyssop-like cure for this sin because I need this sin to quit making me sick. Have you reached that point with your sin sometimes? Have you reached that point with, with the issues in your life where they're literally making you sick and you're saying, God, I need you to take care of this sin. I need you to take care of this issue in my life. Not just for the spiritual aspects of it, but, but God is making me ill physically. That's where David is right, in, right now. He's literally saying this sin, this issue in my life is literally making me sick to my stomach. You know, we, I talked earlier about the first step is admitting there's a problem. I think sometimes before you get to that first step, you got to get sick to your stomach about the problem. <laughs> sometimes we wait and let that problem fester until it just makes us sick. That's what David's done here. He's let that problem fester until it made him sick. I want you to notice other statements that David makes here. Wash me whiter than snow. He's asking for purification. Make me hear joy and gladness. He's, he's when you read these words, it's, it's, you come to understanding David has reached a point of depression. He's sick to his stomach. He has zero joy, zero gladness. He's looking at the snow and, and, and wanting that, that whiteness, that type of whiteness. And look at this last one. Let my broken bones rejoice. How many of y'all ever had broken bones? I've never rejoiced over a broken bone. <laughs> but David is saying here is my bones are broken. And I want to reach a point where even they rejoice. But here's the one statement I really want us to focus on. Towards the end of this section, David makes a statement, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. And, and, and those of y'all who are on the text, y'all got this picture sent out. And, and several months ago, I, I came across this. And it's called Kintsuji Pottery. And it's a Japanese method of restoring pottery. And what they do is, 
they take the broken pieces of a, of a bowl or a piece of pottery and they seal it back together using gold as their sealant. And when they get done and the restoration is complete, the item that they've, that they've restored ends up being more valuable than it was before it was broken. See, that's what happens when God restores us. God takes all those broken pieces of our lives and when he restores it, he doesn't just put it together with Gorilla Glue or super glue or anything like that he seals us with gold he seals us with the purity of his love the purity of his salvation and see david says restore to me the joy of my salvation he's asking for that pure restoration and just like the japanese use pure gold to restore that pottery God uses the pure gold of his love and his compassion to restore us. And when he gets done restoring us, we're more valuable than we were before we were broken. And then David goes on. He says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. O oh God, the God of my salvation, then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O oh Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. See, when restoration happens, profession follows. See, when you're restored and when you're restored God's way, there's really nothing left to do but to share that restoration with the world. See, the beauty of the Kintsuji pottery is that they don't hide the repair marks. You can see them clear as day. They're right there. And that's the beauty of it is they don't hide those repair marks. Those lines are proof that brokenness and restoration has occurred. When God restores us, we shouldn't try to hide that restoration from the world. Don't pretend that you were never broken. Let those golden repair marks shine as proof of a compassionate God who not only mends your broken pieces, but does so in a way that makes you more valuable than you originally were. See, when we try to restore ourselves, we get scabs of flesh. When we let God restore us, we get scars of gold. Last section. For you do not delight in sacrifice. Otherwise, I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. The broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. See, God doesn't really want our sacrificial gifts. He's not concerned with sacrificial gifts. See, sacrificial gifts come from a place of you trying to earn a free, priceless gift with worthless effort. Let me say that again. When we focus on our sacrifices... It is us trying to earn a free, priceless gift with worthless effort. God wants brokenness more than anything. He wants brokenness. Bring to him a humbled, broken soul and allow him to restore you with his purest gold. Then share your newfound value with the rest of the world.
Let's pray. Father God, again we come to you thanking you for all that you do for us. God, we all struggle with sin. We all have issues in our lives that we let consume us to the point that it makes us sick. God, we come to you with our broken pieces. We come to you with our shattered dreams. God, we ask that you restore us. That you restore us in a way that only you can. With your pure love of gold. And God, with that golden love of restoration... We then want to be able to present our newfound value to the world around us. That our scars of gold will show the world around us that there is ultimate value in the restoration that can only be delivered from you. God, I ask you to just go with us, guide us, and direct us. Help us to be a light to the world around us. In Jesus' name.